We start with a seven on your side news alert. We just talked to deputies and state agents processing the scene of a startling crime. They want to catch the punks who targeted a church trashing this building. It all happened here at Buffalo United Methodist Church on Hill Street in Buffalo. Seven on your side's Drew Smith just spoke to the investigators. So Drew, what are they telling you? Well, Amy, they are still inside the church actually right now. You can see the doors are closed. This is an active crime scene. In fact, the sheriff just arrived here on the scene and we've been talking to them all afternoon. The state law enforcement division is here to help because this is such a complex scene. They're here with their forensic uh, investigators trying to figure out exactly who did this. Now, a lot of the people from the church were outside waiting for most of the afternoon. They couldn't get in. They actually had Bible school scheduled. They've moved that to another church. A lot of other churches in the community have been helping out with this church now that it is closed because of all of that graffiti inside. The pastor was the one to discover all of that hate symbols, the torn up Bibles inside of the church. Uh, he says, you know, this kind of incident will only make the church stronger. But again, there's no denying that this is a despicable crime. There's a lot of anger and dislike in someone's heart, and that's something we all have to pray about and, and pray for those people that hurt us as, as much as, as, as we can. And we are waiting to go inside the church. The sheriff again just arrived, so we're going to go inside and look at all of that uh, material that is posted on the walls inside of this church. And this has been a busy couple of weeks for Union County investigators. We had that double murder last week. The two people charged in that murder are being investigated for ties to hate groups. We've asked investigators, is there any connection between these two crimes? We'll have that answer for you tonight at 6 o'clock. That's the latest live in Union County in Buffalo. I'm Drew Smith, 7 on your side. All right, Drew, thanks. Now. A seven on your side news alert. Yet another we're following for you. We've just learned about upstate ties to a major sex trafficking bust. The Twitter tip came into me in the last hour, and Graham Moore is digging into this breaking story. Graham. Amy, yeah, you uh, passed along that tip you got just a little while ago. We began looking into it. You may have heard about this huge nationwide bust over the past uh, a couple of days over the weekend. More than 150 pimps arrested across the United States in 76 cities, some 105 children. Uh, recovered children who had been exploited, sexually exploited in the uh, sex trafficking trade. And we are just learning that two of those individuals who were arrested are from uh, Greenville here in the upstate. They were arrested in Birmingham, Alabama. We have got the jail records. Again, this tip came into us just about uh, 30 minutes ago, so we are trying to track it down. But I've got the names of the individuals arrested in Birmingham, but who are from Greenville. Both of them charged with two counts of human trafficking. Uh, they are Veronica Zane Melvin and Jermaine Omar Williams. Again, still trying to get this information uh, all tied down and uh, get it out to you. We'll try to have that for you at uh, six o'clock. Plus, we're going to look at how often this happens. And if you're anything like me, you're going to be blown away at the number of American children each year who are trafficked into the sex slave uh, trade. Amy? All right, we'll see you with, with those details, disturbing details coming up later. Well, deputies are pouring over surveillance tonight of a wild shooting and crash. A nightclub security guard says he was forced to shoot a woman. The truck sprayed with bullets, crashed, and ended up on this utility pole. It all went down here at Marvin's place on the Highway 28 bypass in Anderson. The coroner says 21-year-old India Lomax died at the scene early Saturday. Investigators have not filed charges. New at 5-7 on your side's Kate Valentine is getting answers about the types of training and requirements for security guards and what it means for your safety. We, in a number of situations, act as their eyes and ears. Security guards provide an added layer of law enforcement, but American Security President Randy Harrison says people might question the security industry when things go wrong. Early Saturday morning, Anderson County investigators say a security guard from a different company fired 11 shots at a truck leaving Marvon's place. One shot hit the female driver, killing her. It's not the first time security officers have used deadly force in our area. Earlier this year, a motel security guard was charged with murder after shooting someone at a motel in Greenville. Investigators decided deadly force was not necessary. And in 2008, a security guard was charged with assault with intent to kill after firing several rounds at a man leaving a club in Welford. South Carolina Law Enforcement Division regulates all security guards. Now, whether armed or unarmed, all security guards have to undergo a certification process before they can begin patrol. Armed security officer candidates are instructed in state law as it applies to the use of deadly force. 
All security guards are required to go through four hours of training, then an additional four hours for armed security training, plus pass a firearms course. In South Carolina, unlike some of the other states, a security officer has the same authority as a deputy sheriff on the property that he's paid, he or she's paid to protect. Anderson County investigators are still trying to determine if the security guard here was protecting the property he was hired to protect. They say the shots came from the parking lot next door. Deputies say typically security guards do more good than harm by freeing up law enforcement. In general, the more people you have keeping the peace, the better off you are. In Anderson County, Kate Valentine, 7 on your side. The Anderson County Sheriff's Office could present its case to the solicitor's office this week, and during that meeting, they'll discuss possible charges. Meantime, deputies continue to interview people. Now, anyone who witnessed what happened early Saturday is asked to call the Anderson County Sheriff's Office, the number 864-260-4400. An update now to a 7 on your side community watchdog report. Elections officials will now take a closer look to find out if a mayoral candidate lives in the city that he wants to lead. We first told you nearly two weeks ago that Henri Thompson was registered to vote outside the city limits of Spartanburg. However, he changed his registration just a few days before filing to run for mayor of Spartanburg. Now, when our first story aired, Spartanburg County Election Director Henry Lay couldn't check into the claims because no one had filed a challenge. But Lay told us today that someone has challenged Thompson's candidacy, so the board will decide if his registration follows the law. There will be a public hearing at 10 a.m. on Wednesday, August the 7th. It'll be in the county council chambers on Church Street, and of course, we will let you know what happens. All new at 5 and a 7 on your side, State House Watch. Lawmakers voted moments ago to take steps toward protecting your identity. We were at the Budget and Control Board meeting this afternoon in Columbia. That board's been taking bids from identity protection companies to see what they charge for credit monitoring. Today, the board approved the list of items they're asking companies to provide. The next step is to accept a bid from a qualified company. A breach at the State Department of Revenue last fall compromised the personal information of nearly 4 million South Carolina taxpayers. Happening moments from now, a local county council is preparing to take a vote on an incentives package that could bring more than 300 jobs to the area. Greenwood County Council is calling the deal Project Sun for now. We spoke to the Greenwood Partnership Alliance. That group tells us they're trying to get a manufacturing company to move in and invest $200 million. We'll let you know what happens at that meeting. Happening tomorrow, county leaders are trying to get a handle on just how much damage homeowners are dealing with after the recent rains and storms. This is just some of the mess left behind in Pickens County, and now emergency management is asking anyone who has damage not covered by insurance to let their office know about it. The meetings are tomorrow and Thursday at 5. They'll be in the community meeting room at Clemson City Hall. And there's a call for volunteers to help clean up a park damaged by the flooding. The Lights of Hope group is gathering at Darwin Wright Park tomorrow. That's going on from 9 until noontime. It's on Liberty Highway right off exit 21 on Interstate 85 in Anderson County. They want to clean up that park so that it can reopen before end of summer. And new at 5, President Barack Obama is challenging Republicans to accept a deal to cut corporate tax rates and spend more on jobs programs. And here's the truth. There are no gimmicks that create jobs. There are no simple tricks to grow the economy. The president announced the offer during a visit to a massive Amazon.com plant in Tennessee. Republicans are accusing the president of repackaging proposals that he already supports while making no concessions to the opposing party. The president visited Amazon because of the online retailer announcing it's hiring thousands of new workers at its distribution centers. We first told you yesterday how that includes more than 100 new jobs at the facility in Spartanburg County. The shipping positions are not high skilled, but they pay decent. The company says the only requirement is that you have a great attitude and you are willing to work. The new hires will bump the number of full-time employees to more than 500 in Spartanburg County. We have all the information on how you can apply through WSPA.com. New at 5, a verdict has been reached in the case of an Army private accused of aiding the enemy and releasing classified information to anti-secrecy group WikiLeaks. Jerika Duncan has more. Army Private First Class Bradley Manning stood in front of a military judge as she found him not guilty of aiding the enemy in the biggest leak of classified information in U.S. history. That was the most serious charge that could have put him in prison for life. But the judge did find the 25-year-old guilty of 19 other charges, including espionage, theft, and computer fraud. Manning faced a court-martial for leaking more than 700,000 classified documents to the website WikiLeaks. He has admitted leaking the information. During the nearly two-month trial, prosecutors called Manning a traitor. 
They say while he was a low-ranking intelligence analyst in Baghdad, he handed over State Department cables, Iraq and Afghanistan battlefield reports, and videos, among other material. WikiLeaks released some of the information online in 2010, including footage of a 2007 U.S. Apache helicopter attack that killed civilians in Iraq. The defense argued Manning is a naive whistleblower who didn't think the information he leaked would threaten U.S. security. They say he chose information the public needed to know. Some of his supporters rallied outside Fort Meade in Maryland. If people like Bradley can't stand up and tell us what our government is doing when it's wrong, ostensibly wrong, then we're in a lot of trouble. After the verdict, Manning's attorney spoke to the crowd. He says his client won the battle but still needs to win the war. A sentencing hearing begins Wednesday. Manning faces a maximum of 136 years behind bars. Jerika Duncan, 7 on your side. On Twitter, WikiLeaks called Manning's convictions dangerous national security extremism from the Obama administration. Big changes are on the way for your weather. Let's get straight to Storm Team 7 Chief Meteorologist Christy Henderson. All right, Amy, well, no rain reported today at GSP for the third day in a row, but that is going to be changing as we're tracking a system out west. It's bringing some rain to the middle part of Tennessee, and all of that is moving our way. I'll let you know when it's going to arrive and how much rain we could see from that system in my forecast coming up. All right, Christy, thanks. A massive fireball tonight. That scene is still smoldering. The new clues about this devastating scene and why a firefighting tool didn't help. That's next. Plus, raise your glass, the new twist in a fight to ban big sugary drinks. On the way at 530 tonight, a woman devastated by sewage spilling into her yard. We've been following her story now for months. Now her city is actually helping her move out of that mess. And all new at 6, it's a new requirement for your 7th graders to attend school this year. And you can get your child's vaccination for free. What you need to know in a 7 on your side medical watch at 6. There are new details tonight about an explosion at a propane plant that sent massive flames into the sky. You see these flames happen overnight northwest of Orlando. A fire official says an equipment malfunction or human error may have started the fire. Eight people were hurt today. Smoke still billowed from the plant. The parking lot, look at that. It's littered with thousands of propane containers, the kind of stuff you use at your propane uh, tanks for your grill, that turned into fireballs. One man who managed to escape says it was his first night on the job. It probably threw me back about three feet. I just kind of got up and just ran, and it just kept going off. It looked like, like, like missiles of cylinders flying everywhere. The fire chief says hoses set up to spray water on the tanks didn't go off as planned because they had to be manually activated. He added, quote, most sane people don't stick around for an event like this. Meantime, a contractor's cigarette is being blamed for a gas explosion that leveled a row home in Philadelphia. That's according to a city councilman at the scene. That vacant home was being remodeled. Two adjacent homes partially collapsed. Eight people were hurt, including the contractor. He's in critical condition with burns. New at 5, a crackdown on those big sugary sodas is staying on ice. An appeals court has ruled that New York City's attempt to limit the size of the drinks is unconstitutional. Benita Nyer has reaction. New Yorkers can keep filling up any size soda they want. An appeals court ruled New York City's ban on sugary drinks is unconstitutional. I agree with the ruling that it's um, kind of overstepping. It's the latest setback for New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg, who has been pushing to limit sweetened beverages to 16 ounces in an effort to fight obesity. A lower court struck down the size limit in March, the day before it was supposed to go into effect. Obesity has many things that are contributing to it, but the single largest contributor is sugary drinks. And we know that the size portion that's served to people has a big influence on how much people drink. The ban would have applied to places like sandwich shops and movie theaters. They would have to get rid of 32 ounce cups like this one. Sheikh Hassan owns a Subway sandwich shop on Manhattan's west side. They buy the 16 ounce or 21 ounce cheaper. They go for, it's a free. They go for second one. Some called the ban unfair because it did not affect supermarkets or most convenience stores and it didn't target other high calorie drinks. But some New Yorkers still thought it was a good beginning. Some people are still going to do it, but I think just having the law will affect some people, not all. Mayor Bloomberg says the ruling is a temporary setback and promises to appeal. Vanita Nyer, CBS News, New York. The drinks limit was the latest Bloomberg effort to make New Yorkers healthier. His administration also forced chain restaurants to post calorie counts on menus and barred restaurants from using tra artificial trans fats.
There are new details tonight about a new round of peace talks in the Middle East. Israeli and Palestinian officials met in Washington today. They've agreed to future negotiations with all issues on the table, including the borders of a future Palestinian state and who gets control of Jerusalem. Expectations are low, but both sides appear hopeful a deal can be reached. The Pentagon is reconsidering an end to so-called danger pay for U.S. troops serving in the Middle East. Defense Department officials say they are rethinking the move because of the recent increase in violence in the region. The cuts trim the Pentagon's budget by $120 million a year. Imminent danger pay earns troops an extra $225 a month. There's been no decision yet. Pay for troops serving in Afghanistan would not be affected. Two stars of the reality TV show Real Housewives of New Jersey are free on half a million dollars bond each. You can see Teresa Judice and her husband Joe arriving in federal court this morning in Newark. Officials say they conspired to defraud lenders and obtain mortgages illegally. They're also accused of making false statements on loan applications and bankruptcy fraud. The two face up to 30 years in prison and a million dollar fine. Now we're getting some new video of a brazen jailbreak. It has the police still on a manhunt and it days later. The man was in the detention center in Garland County, Arkansas, when he made a run for it on Sunday. Here he goes. He was on the phone in the booking area and he just jumps over the counter and then takes off, runs away. A deputy lost him during the chase. A woman was waiting nearby with a getaway car. The man was in jail on charges that included robbery, theft and fleeing. Well, many of us have had a nice, quiet day. It actually started out very nice in the mountains with lows in the 50s this morning. When well, temperatures have been warming up, we're right now at our daytime high for the day, 85 degrees over at GSP, some sunshine, some clouds out there, clouds during the evening hours, but mostly dry weather. So an isolated shower could still pop up. But I think in most cases, we'll stay dry. So if you're heading out to dinner, no problems there. 76 degrees by 9 o'clock. Tomorrow's a different story, though. The last day of July, it's been a wet July for us, and wouldn't you know, it's going to rain. For a few showers, maybe an isolated thunderstorm tomorrow morning. Better chance of storms tomorrow afternoon, and we'll expect a high near 84 degrees. So it's 